Okay, so this is part 2.2. Um, we are just going to continue on this page. Okay, back to you, Daniel. Yeah, we'll, we'll restart with this new chapter. Yes. I, I can't see the page yet. Okay. Uh, what can you see? Because I'm sharing my screen. Okay, we try one more time. I'm sharing it now. Tell me if you can see this. Sure. Yeah, now I can see it, yeah. Okay, all right, over to you. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, go over this chapter. It's about the Bose anatomy. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think there are a lot of books about uh, horse Bose anatomy, uh, Adam Karpovich, Thomas Duvernay, uh, some, uh, some works on uh, Turkish bow design as well. So I think I'll just go over quickly uh, in these diagrams, I wanted to show how uh, the ball was kind of put together in an understandable manner. So uh, for the uh, Manchu type ball, we have five part wooden uh, mm -hmm. core, uh, two CS, one handle and two shoulder. And uh, we have uh, of either work or sometimes uh, Clad in in leather, and this is uh, uh, for the lar the large Manchu type, uh, the five part core wooden core, and now we can go to the next page. Mm. I need the next page. Yes, uh, I just went to the next page. You can't see it yet. Sorry, Daniel, one second. Okay. Okay, can you see that page? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, I can see it now. Yeah. Okay, all right. All right. I'm ready. Yeah, this one. So uh, this one is uh, uh, go go back one more, please. Go back one. Uh. Yep, this one. Okay. So this one. Uh, no, the next one. Sorry. All right, let's leave it here. Uh, this is just a representation of the uh, <clears throat> uh, the one on the top is lesser horse ball of uh, Crimean Tatar type. Uh, one of the options uh, is they were made either from three parts wooden core or five parts wooden core. And this one is a representation of three parts when they mm. Sia and the shoulder, the, the bending part, are made from one piece of wood. And th there is another option where they made of uh, five parts, too. Mm -hmm. And uh, it shows how uh, also how the string was made. And I think you covered that uh, with somebody uh, previously that it was the strings were made in three parts. Uh, the two parts uh, got to uh, string. Uh, uh, 
where the string attaches mm -hmm. and the one in the middle is the working part and e either part could be replaced yeah because uh, right. strings were uh, very val valuable at, at that mm -hmm. point so uh we can skip to the next uh, image no go ahead one more uh, okay next this. image we'll see the sections mm -hmm. yeah yeah this one uh this is again uh these are sections uh of uh, lesser kazakh horsebow and large kazakh horsebow now they're mm -hmm. showing not just the geometry, but also how the materials are are, are, are spread within these sections. Uh, so we have horn layer, we have wooden core, and then we have sinew. Uh, and how, how the two types uh, are different between each other. And uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this one is kind of addressing your earlier question about uh, the shape of the st uh, string bridge. And I'm showing here just a few different types of string bridge, uh, mm. one in, in Kazakhstan, uh, one in uh, Korea, mm -hmm. one in Turkey, and one in Mongolia. Mm. Uh, you can see they're all slightly different, but the idea is the same they're preventing mm -hmm. uh, string from slipping during mm -hmm. a shot. And let's go to the next one. Um, ju just before we move on, so the string bridges are only there to provide a kind of a secure platform to keep the string on. Do you, do you have any information about, for example, if we look at the Mongolian one, it's quite a big uh, piece of wood, extra piece on the bow. Does this have an effect on velocity, on speed, on performance? Anything like that? Uh, no, in my opinion, uh, this is the one in Mongolia is, uh, I've drawn it from my bow, from the one I own, Mongolian mm. bow that I own. Uh, I don't know if it's a recent uh, improvement or it's been like this before, uh, but my, uh, uh, my opinion is that it's designed uh, to be more secure to prevent uh, from the slipping, but it mm -hmm. does not affect anything else. It's just mm. a security measure. Yep. D does it have anything to do with uh, the different uh, thickness of strings? For example, I think with the Mongolian bow, the larger bows, the strings maybe have more strands or maybe thicker, like a rope, rather than say the Turkish or Korean is thinner. Mm, probably not. Mm, probably okay. not. In my opinion, it's just uh, to make it as safe as possible. Also, for giving the uh, the slight twists that might occur. The the bigger the mm -hmm. bridge is, the more forgiving it for these slight twists. You know. Right. So that's okay. my take. Sure. Okay. Next one. Yep. Next one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one on the top just shows different uh, uh, methods of uh, enforcing the string knock because it's a very vulnerable uh, uh, place in any mm. horse bow. And I've seen that happening. So uh, on the one starting from the left one, this is just a self knock, very simple but it's not suitable for more powerful bows because eventually it will break off even if it's hardwood. So one way to enforce it is to put a band of uh, sinew or similar material uh, mm -hmm. or le hard and, uh, harder leather. So it prevents it from uh, opening and splitting. Uh, another one, uh, the third one from the left, left is where you just cover the entire knock with a piece of leather. Mm. Uh, it's also very good. Uh, uh, the only problem is with time, it might uh, wear off and you will 
have to replace it, but it's it's doable. Mm -hmm. And finally, probably the most uh, the most uh, secure, the most durable one, when they inserted uh, a knock uh, from uh, from different horn, mm -hmm. and then carve the groove the knock in in horn. That it makes it even even sturdier, even more durable. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one on the bottom shows another option is when they just make the make a wedge out of horn. Right. And insert it in the sea in the inside in this uh, hole, insert this hornage. We're done or one more take? No, no, we, we're just gonna finish on this section here. Oh, okay. Yeah, so just continue where we were here. Okay. So uh, go to the next image. Next one. Uh -huh. This one. Yep, yep. Mm. So this is another one of those uh, my uh, insights. Uh, uh, kind of my 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 two cents uh bow to a human body a lot as, as you noticed mm -hmm. and in this one i just wanted to pay, uh, to point out how similar a bow's limb is to a human uh, uh limb mm -hmm. if we're talking about the biocomposite recurve bow of course mm -hmm. because uh it, it in structure it's very similar uh how, just like our our and muscles and skin and skin. You bow. Uh, it has uh, pretty much biceps and triceps. It has bone. You know, the wooden core is a bone. It has sinews. Uh, and it, it works pretty much like uh, uh, our arms uh, mm -hmm. do. So uh, I was wondering uh, whether maybe at some point some you know uh, genius came up with this idea to make mm. a, a bow more mm. like human arms or something. Whether mm. it's a coincidence <clears throat> or whether it's by design, uh, we probably will never find out. But this is very curious. And also, uh, I wanted to kind of emphasize this because a lot of people talk about how uh, a biocomposite bow is alive and you have to massage it and twist it and give it a stretch. Mm -hmm. And I think this uh, image kind of illustrates this point very nicely. Yes, mm -hmm. it is alive because it's imitating our limbs. And that's why just like before your exercises, you would have to stretch a little bit uh, to perform well, same way you have to do with the biocomposite bow. Indeed. Yeah, I, I, I love the way that you yeah. have shown the very close connection of uh, the human body with the bow. And, you know, we see this in, 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 in other kind of books and historical um, books, or even poetry and things like that, where uh, there's a very close connection of the bow with the human body, the way the, um, the body is made up of these three or four different components. You know, you have the skin, which is like the leather of the bow. You have the bone, yep, yep. which is the bone and the skeleton. You have the sinew, which is the ligaments. Exactly. Um, you have the horn and things like that. So I definitely think there's, there's a connection yep, there. Yep. And um, on your point of, you know, who came up with yep. this, I, I agree, we, we'll never know. But one interesting thing, thing that um, I, I always like to think about is, um, when we look at many Aboriginal communities, so, you know, native communities around the world, um, there was a point where, you know, mm -hmm. in our day and age, we are, we're very connected, but there was a time when um, native people in sub-Saharan Africa never knew about native people in uh, Borneo or South America or Red Indians or uh, Aboriginals, Australia, right, et cetera, right. et cetera. 
But the interesting point is that the majority of these Aboriginal communities featured archery in one form or another, whether it be for hunting, for survival, for defense, for attack. They all had an element of the bow and the arrow or launching something from a bow. And I yep. find this fascinating uh, yep. that, yep. you know, they were in some way inspired by this, um, you know, to have this form of, of, uh, uh, um, of, of weapon, I guess. And my own personal point of view is that, you know, I, I think this is a very, this is kind of like a divinely inspired um, skill and art form, which was given to all of these pure uh, and more natural um, communities, you know, as a way of helping yep. them to survive. Because, you know, um, no doubt many of them would have um, been exterminated or would not have survived if they did not have the bow and the arrow. Yes, they know. We know they had other weapons for survival and things, but the bow and the arrow was really, really pivotal and key to their survival. So, um, again, I don't have evidence of that, of course, but you know, that's it, it, what other way is there to explain of how all these different communities around the world, in different times and and eras, um, had uh, you know featured the bow and arrow in their communities. So it's it's another interesting observation. Yep, yep. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I agree with you. Bow, bow is very important for all of the people. It's one of the universal values that everybody uh, accept immediately all over the world. Absolutely. Uh, regardless, regardless of faith, culture, language, sure. uh, uh, color of skin, and etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we, we can all agree. Bow is, archery is uniting us. 100 percent 100 percent um again i want to commend you on on your observations here and the images that you've drawn with the light that you know the similarity of of the human body and the bows and things like that and raising how the biomechanics uh changes according to the shape of the bow uh, i think that that yep. is a very strong argument um i i will be you know doing my best to really promote and push the book itself but also these particular chapters to you know the authorities we have in the archery world you know the Stephen Selby's the Murat Osveri's uh the Adam which is these people and many many more um to get their view on this um it's the first time I've seen I think you're probably the first one to have drawn these um these similarities in such a way um and again fortunately you're such a a very skilled artist that it comes over very simply um, and very clearly. So, um, you know, I hope that, you know, at some point in the future, uh, you know, we can have some type of, you know, live forum or meeting or convention with all of these authorities, including yourself. And, you know, we can discuss these, these inter interesting topics and we can learn a little bit more about, um, you know, uh, the hidden secrets of, of archery, because I think, as much as we do know, there's probably more that we still have yet to discover. Would you agree? Of course, of course, yeah. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for, for your kind words. And as to why I uh, view a bow as more of a life organism, a life uh, creature, I think it's part of my uh culture the nomadic culture because we lived in the nature we we were uh, uh animal uh we, we we lived with livestock mm -hmm. we 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 still kept this kind of uh, uh you know uh, animalistic view uh with in other words we i don't see i don't look at the bow as this mechanical device that you just engineer and you know it performs to a certain degree Mm -hmm. and you can just throw it or replace it we see it as an, a life uh almost like creature or, or so to speak it's no wonder that they used to give names uh to bows uh in in the past because every bow had its personality and uh, every bow needed an approach kind of like a horse 
pretty much like you 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 don't just hop on a horse like a motorcycle or, or bicycle you have to train them you have to learn them same approach to the bows bow is alive it's been created by a master it has to be taken care uh, properly it has to be maintained properly stretched and massaged and then you get the the, the bow will repay you with good shooting mm -hmm. so to speak so yes that i think that i think uh is part of my culture to 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 see world from this kind of point of view because as nomads we are more biological than mechanical mm. so absolutely yeah i think there's a strong argument that you know the um the bow is they say the bow is the extension of the archer. So, you know, when you're shooting, it's not yes, just yes. how good you are, but the bow is part of the, it is part of the equation. It's, it's, it's a joint effort together. You know, the archer, right. your job is right. just to pull, pull the string, but when you release your job is done and the bow takes over and the bow delivers the shot. So right. there's, it's definitely, um, you know, um, much more than, like you say, just a mechanical advice, uh, device. But um, no, that, that's that's very interesting. A lot, a lot to think on there. I hope that people who are watching this will um, have a lot of food for thought and um, definitely uh, read through the book that you've that you've um, that you've put so much effort into. Um, and before my connection <laughs> dies on us again, we'll we'll wrap this 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 part two up. Um, in the next session, we want to talk about. Um, whatever is remaining in the book of the contents, we want to uh, maybe have a look at your Etsy uh, page, your paintwork, your artwork as well. Um, you're certainly a very uh, gifted uh, uh, artist. And also an important part of, of, of the Kazakh culture is the horses. We want to learn about Thank you. maybe horse breeds, um, you know, uh, the history yeah. of maybe breeding um, uh, battle horses, uh, horses for horse archery, um, what type of horse breeds they have in Kazakhstan, um, and is the culture today the same? Uh, you know, is, are horses a key part of um, the children growing up, or is there still a divide, or you know, what's the situation? So we'll hopefully talk um, a little bit more about that in the next session. Uh, until then, Daniel, thank you very much. Um, God be with you. Great, great. Hope of peace, and uh, thank we'll you. see you in the next one. All right. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. Thank you. See you.